Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless.
Good morning. Happy New Year. Who here actually stayed up till midnight last night? Okay, me neither. I was, I was in bed at 9.30, but props to you guys who were able to stay up and do it. For those who don't know me, I am Pastor Josh. I am the minister of middle school students slash families. As my middle school students will be able to tell you, I like to have a memorable sermon title or message title uh, for every week and something that they can take home with them. So with that being said, my title for today's sermon is Kill the Old Man. The first point I want to make with that is that sometimes newness requires destruction of the old. So who here remembers Y2K? A few of you? I don't. I was five. But I have been very interested to hear stories from people talking about how they thought the society was going to shut down and the banks were going to shut down because it was going to hit the year 2000 and the clocks wouldn't work right. All throughout history in the Bible, we see sometimes the old thing passing away in destruction and chaos and then the new thing coming about. We see that through the flood. New life came about on the earth through the flood, but it came at the destruction of everything through the flood. We see in Hebrews, which Pastor Chris is going through right now, we see the covenant that is brought about through Christ coming with the passing away of the old covenant. And then going forward to Revelation, we see a new everything, a new heavens and a new earth, but it coming at the destruction of everything. The earth will pass away like snow, right? So we see all throughout history and all throughout scripture of sometimes the new coming at the destruction of the old. With that, the Christian life itself must first begin with death. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. Uh, make sure you turn to chapter 6. I was practicing this with my wife yesterday, and I was practicing my sermon, and at the end of it, she said she had one criticism, and she said the verses just felt like they didn't really add up with what I was talking about. And then we realized that she was reading after, out of chapter 5. So make sure you go to chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. And the book of Romans is really the Apostle Paul explaining the gospel throughout the entire book. It's really him showing what it means to have a theology that's centered on Christ. So Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 5 says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. What's this? Oh, united it with a death like his. That doesn't sound super pleasant. That doesn't sound, what, what is this talking about? United with him in death. A lot of us as Christians, we know that the Christian faith is centered on the death of Jesus on the cross. Not all of us recognize that a part of that is our death on the cross as well. What does that mean? We're going to look into that. So, moving, uh, let me back up a little bit first. And so, the end of chapter 5, what it's talking about is the grace that's given to us by Christ's sacrifice, that our sins have now been cleaned and wiped away. But chapter 6 begins with saying, well, hey, just because our sins have been wiped away, does that mean that we can just now just go on sinning and it doesn't really matter or we've been saved? The Apostle Paul says in verse 1, he says, absolutely not. He says, surely not. We can't go on sinning. He says, instead, what's happened is that we have now been made dead to sin. He says that we've been baptized with Christ in his death to sin. So what does that mean? Well, I was explaining baptism to one of my students a few weeks ago before he was baptized, and I explained to him that really, Baptism symbolizes three main things, okay? So the first thing that happens when we're baptized, what we're showing is that Christ, he died, and then he, was, and then he rose again after three days. He was made back alive. Christ rose from the dead and conquered death by doing it. The second thing, what it shows, is that we've been washed and our sins have been washed away and we rise up having been made clean, okay? The third, final thing, it's very important, is that it shows that our old self, our sinful self, the self that's completely centered on ourselves, that's selfish, that's prideful, that's sinful, that's destined for hell, that self was made dead. That self died. It was killed and buried. 
and now the new self was made alive. That's what baptism shows, is when we come up out of the water, the new self has been made through Christ. So with that, we're going to, if we look forward in the rest of verse 5, it says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And with that, that resurrection is twofold. The first it means that we are, when we have passed on from this earthly coil, when we have died physically, we will be resurrected in heaven with Jesus. It's something we get to look forward to as Christians. But it also means that just as Christ was dead and was raised to life, we have now been resurrected into a new spiritual life. We are not the same. That old self has been passed away. Paul, when he says old self, the Greek is actually the old man. Basically, our old self, our previous self, that self has now actually died and been put away. That self that was destined for hell has been crucified, has been killed. And part of the reason for that is because that old self, that old man, was a slave. My second point is becoming new means not being enslaved to the old. Later on in the chapter, this chapter of Romans, in chapter 6, Paul talks about how each of us, whether we realize it or not, begins life as a slave. We might not think it. We might feel like, oh, we just get to decide to do whatever we want. We can just do anything. But we don't realize that we're actually each born enslaved to sin. I might be able to do good things for a little bit. I might be able to try to do good things. But usually, even when I do those good things, it's for selfish purposes. It's because it makes me feel good, or it makes me see myself better, or it makes me happy, or it makes me look good. There's a selfish reason behind all those good things we do before we have Christ. And with that, there's usually sins in our lives that keep us captured, that keep us, keep us as slaves, these addictions that bury us and keep us and make us feel trapped. No matter how much we try to quit them, we can't. We keep getting pulled back into them. But what being a Christian means is that we're no longer slaves. The old man, the old self, the enslaved self, was crucified on the cross. Jesus has made it so that old self, that body, has been brought to nothing. We're no longer enslaved to sin, where we previously had no choice at all but to keep on sinning, to keep choosing sin eventually. We now have the choice to choose righteousness. I can tell you that in my own life, I experienced that slavery. For too much of my life, I, Josh Pinkerton, was trapped in addiction and self-seeking behaviors. Stop me if this sounds familiar, but I probably said the words, I promise this is the last time about 10,000 times. But what Jesus did was he made it so that I had a choice. He made it so that I was able to seek help, that I was able to confess my sins, to talk to others, to get help, and to begin choosing righteousness. Through him, I've now been clean from certain sins for years. And that's not a unique story. I've talked with people here at the church, other Christians all over, where everybody has so many similar stories where they were trapped and mired in this sin, and, and they just felt like they couldn't escape it. And yet Jesus provided the means by which they could be free. Because that's what Jesus does. He, he goes and he finds us while we're trapped. He finds us while we've got the chains on us, and he sets us free. He finds us while we're in the muck, in the grossness, in the garbage, and he comes and he pulls us out of it. He finds the shackles that are locked on us, and he breaks them apart. He makes new free men out of the old men, out of the slaves. Because becoming new requires not being enslaved to the old. So moving forward in verse 7, it says, For one who has died has been set free from sin. So for one who has died has been set free from sin. So what does that mean? It means Christians are perfect, right? No, obviously not. Christians are not, I mean, just a quick glance around the room will show you that Christians, or just a quick glance to the front of the room will tell you that Christians are not perfect, right? That's not what this is talking about. What it's saying is that we now are free to choose. We now have the, now we are no longer enslaved 
to destruction, to death, to hell. We are no longer eternally separated from God. We now have the choice to find eternal salvation and find eternal life in heaven. But beyond that, we also have the choice now where we no longer are constantly having to choose sin. We now can choose things that are honoring to God. We can choose righteousness. The problem, though, is, and I'm about to say something very theologically profound here, so just make sure you write this down. I'm still a blockhead, okay? I'm still a blockhead sometimes, and even though I can choose the right thing, I sometimes will still choose the wrong thing because while I'm still in this old body, because I might have been given new spiritual life, but I still am in my old physical body, while I'm still in that body, I'm still going to choose sin sometimes, I, yeah, some, you, a few of you know what I'm talking about, right? I'm still going to choose sin oftentimes. One day, there will come a day where Jesus will give us all brand new bodies. He will completely sanctify us, completely purify us, and we won't have that sin anymore. But until then, there comes times where we still choose sin. I forget who made the sermon illustration, but a Christian once said that Christians are like pigs. So Christians... We start out and we're, we're pigs. We're inside of the pig pen. We're, we're eating slop. We're covering ourselves in mud. We're gross. We're disgusting. And then one day Jesus comes along and he sees us in that mud. And instead of leaving us there, what he does is he sacrificed himself. He made it so that we could instead become people. He picks us up. He transforms us. He changes us. He puts clothes on us. He gives us food, real human food. He teaches us what it's like to get out of the mud, to come forward and actually be people. But the problem is, sometimes, for some reason, we'll still return to that pig pen. Even after we've been taught to be people, we'll go back and we'll get back in the mud and we'll start eating that slop again. Even though it's disgusting, it's familiar. It's, we've, we're We've spent so long in that that sometimes it's easy for us to go back to it, even though we know it's bad for us, even though we know that it doesn't actually fill us, it doesn't feel the same anymore, it's familiar. So we go back to it. And thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit now to convict us after a while and say, wait a second, this, this doesn't feel right anymore. I'm not a pig anymore. I'm a person. Why am, I, why am I back here in the mud? Why am I back here eating pig slop? And thankfully, even in that moment, Jesus brings us back out of it. He returns us back and continues to show us what it means to be a person. With that, that's where we get to my final point. It says, becoming new requires accepting Jesus' salvation of the old. So in verses 8 through 11, it says, for if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once and for all. For the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So basically, what this is saying here is Jesus, he had to die once for our sins, But once he died and did that, he conquered death once and for all. Jesus is never going to die again. He now reigns eternally alive in heaven with the Father. The life he now lives brings eternal glory to both himself and to the Father. What Jesus does is he makes it so that our old self, that self we had, died and passed away, but now we have been resurrected into new life, And that new life we've been given, it's for the purpose of bringing glory to the Father. That's why we've been given this new life. It's not so that we can just go and not have to worry about hell anymore. He gives us this new life so that we can now bring glory to the Father. That's why we have this new life, is so that we can use it to bring glory to the Father. He allows us to do that. He allows us to be truly alive to be truly choosing righteousness and bringing glory to the Father. We are dead to ourselves, but now alive to God. I personally know that oftentimes death and life are intertwined. Thirteen years ago today, my grandmother, who worked here at the church, she passed away on New Year's Day. It was very difficult for me and my family 
there was, honestly, on that day at the hospital at Baptist, it kind of felt like the world ended. And, it, and there was a, sh- a time afterwards where I really began to question my own faith and question, you know, God's plan. My grandfather, it actually hit even worse. My grandfather, after my grandma passed away, he went through a period of time where he didn't even want to be alive. He just wished that he could just be with my grandma wherever she was. He did not want to be alive. Day after day, we would go and visit him, try and cheer him up and bring him up out of it, and he would just say, I I just don't even want to be here anymore. That changed several years after where he actually had a gallbladder surgery that had lots of complications with it, and he actually had to be medically put in a medically induced coma for several days. During that time that my grandfather was in this coma, he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw my grandma. He saw her in heaven. He saw that she was happy, and he actually was able to talk to her. And he, while he talked to her, he said, Connie, please, come back. Come back to me. Come back to me. I need you to come back. I can't do this. I need you to come back. And her response was, I don't want to come back. I'm happy. This is where all my friends are, is what she said. And I don't know if that was a prophetic dream or what, but I, what I do know is that after my grandpa came out of that coma and had that dream, he, something had radically changed in him. He knew that my grandma, while she had physically died, she was now spiritually alive in heaven and much, much happier. She was in a, in a place where she was actually with Jesus. Sometimes physical death leads to true life. With that, both to the non-Christian and to the Christian, I have three applications for each of you going through those three points that I just went through. The first, sometimes becoming new requires destruction of the old. If you're not a Christian, you already know that something isn't right, right? You already feel that there's something wrong. You might try to fill in that gap, to fill in that void with other things. You think, you know, it's the new year. If I can just start working out enough, or if I can just start eating right, or if I can just find the right person, or if if I can just, you know, do something right, things are going to feel better. Things are going to feel right. But the problem is that old self, that old man is never going to be enough. Nothing besides Jesus is ever going to be able to fill that void. It's never going to be able to make it good enough. That old self will never be enough and will ultimately be destroyed one way or another. To the Christian, I want you to please don't forget that that old self is destroyed, that that old self is killed. Some of us who've been made alive, for some reason, we still try to go back to the old sometimes, right? Sometimes we still... We have parts of our old self that are dead, but we weekend at Bernie style try and take that old part of ourselves and carry it with us into the new life, right? We have parts of ourselves that we should have let die, that we should have let been crucified, but we try to dig them up sometimes. I want you to ask yourselves, Christian brothers and sisters, what, is, what are parts of your new life, this new resurrected life, that are actually more reflective of your old self, of the dead self that you are trying to keep with you. Maybe it's the stuff you watch on TV. Maybe it's the stuff you watch on the internet. Maybe it's the stuff you read. Maybe it's the stuff you say. Maybe it's the way you treat your children, you treat your spouse, you treat your significant other, you treat your parents. Maybe it's the things you act and do when nobody's looking. Maybe it's the stuff you do when you're around other people, when you're around certain people. Maybe you're trying to act on and put this persona of being this old dead person, even though inside you've been made alive. Whatever it is, I ask that you be willing to think about finally allowing those things to be dead, to be crucified on the cross with Jesus. The second point, becoming new means not being enslaved to the old. The non-Christians, I'm sure you've found this in your life. I certainly have found it in my life. If you are a Christian, you know it 
from your experience before you were saved, that being, in, that being without Christ means being enslaved. You might be able to start viewing good things for a little bit. You might start being able to get a little bit better, but then after a while, the chain catches and you get pulled back. You might be able to do things for a little while, but before long, too long, you start recognizing that I'm still enslaved. I'm still trapped. I can't actually escape. There's a shackle on my legs. But thankfully, the good news is that Jesus has the keys. Jesus has the ability to set you free from that. It might not be easy, and it might require help, definitely requires help through him, but Jesus has the keys, and he's willing to help you be free. He's willing to set you free. To the Christian, I'm here to remind you of the freedom that you've already been given. You've already been made free. Sometimes, even though we've been set free from the prison, we're blockheads, and we move back into the prison, and, we, and we're not chained up anymore, but for some reason, we still go back in. I'm asking you to remember and to remind yourselves that you've been set free, that Jesus has made it possible that so that you can now walk forward in this new life so that you're no longer trapped, you're no longer imprisoned. Jesus has made it so that you now have this new life going forward. My final point, the third point, was becoming new requires accepting Jesus' salvation of the old. Christian, I want you to take the time today to thank Jesus for his salvation of you. Jesus didn't save this nice, cleaned-up version of you, right? He didn't find you when you were at your best, when you were at church, when you had your nice clothes on. No, Jesus found you at your worst. He finds us when we're stuck in the pit, when we're in the garbage, where we're covered in filth. That's where Jesus finds us. That's where Jesus saves us. He gets down in it with us and picks us up out of it. Jesus did that for you, and he set you free, and it's not so that you could keep doing the same thing you've always done. He set you free so that you could be different, so that that old self, that old man could be killed, could be put away with. Remember that. Go different. Be different because of what Jesus has done in you and because of the new life that he's given you. To the non-Christian, I just want to remind you that Jesus has the keys. He's willing to free you. He's willing to set you free from your slavery. But he's not going to force you, and neither am I. Jesus is a gentleman. He doesn't do anything without our permission. While we're on this earth, we have a choice. We can choose to keep doing things exactly the way we've been doing, right? We can choose to reject him. And yeah, it will never truly feel satisfied, will never truly feel the joy and peace that comes through him. But at the same time, you know, it, I don't have to have faith. I don't have to change anything. However, it ultimately will leave us feeling broken and empty and eternally separated from him. However, we also have the choice to choose him. We have the choice to choose something different. We have the choice to choose him and to allow him to set us free and allow us to really actually begin to choose. He gives us this choice to now begin to choose. A lot of us feel trapped in that old self, that previous self, that old man. But what Jesus has done is he's given us the ability to be set free from that, to become the new person, to become the new man, to become the new woman. Jesus made us, given us that ability to do that. And if you're willing to, if you're willing to allow him to kill the old man, he will. If you're willing to allow him to make you into the new person and give you new life, he will. And that life comes with true joy and true happiness and true life. If that's a choice you'd like to make today, um, Dr. Mike and Red are going to come back up in just a minute after I pray. And the, uh, Pastor Chris is going to come up, and if you'd like to talk to him, I'd ask you to do so. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for just the new year, Lord. 
that we have the ability to start today new, God, that we have the ability to start today as new people. God, I just thank you for the blessing that it is um, to be free in you, Lord, that our chains are gone, we've been set free. Lord, we love you, we praise you. Thank you for letting us die and to be given new life in you. In Jesus' name I pray. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.